I will start this by telling you I am the last woman in the world that should have been able to do what I did. And everybody used to tell me about it. The things I remember are what I couldn't, shouldn't, and wouldn't do. Right? You're too this, you're too that, you're too female, you don't look like a football player, you're too small. And the one thing that I couldn't do when they told me what I shouldn't, wouldn't, and couldn't do was listen. So for all of you out there who have been told you couldn't do anything, let me see a show of hands. Just be so stubborn that you can't listen to them. The voices that you hear in your head are the ones that you choose, okay? Do not ever give anybody power over what you're capable of. That is a choice. And it's your choice that you make not once, but you make it every single day. She mentioned tennis. Well, tennis, I thought I was going to be the next Billie Jean King. That was really good too. But I had a coach who told me because of my size and my build, I would never be strong enough to play pro tennis. You know, maybe he was right. I grew up to play pro football instead. <laughs> I still remember the very first check I got for playing women's professional football. It was 2004. It was at the end of my fourth season. We won a Super Bowl, went undefeated, and I got a ring and a check for $12. And while the amount might be low, the significance was huge because that was a turning point. It was the very first time that we were actually professional, right? Now, I used to refer to it as pro football because I figured we needed a few more zeros before I could justify all those letters. However, the check was so significant to me, and this was before photo deposit, right? You know, you couldn't just cash it and keep it. It was a choice back then, cash it or keep it. So I kept it as a reminder for what we were doing, what we were fighting for, right? When I started playing football, man, the, the, whole, the biggest dream you could have as a woman playing football was to win a Super Bowl, right? Well, by the time I won four, I started wondering what was next. Then all of a sudden I had a chance to play for the U.S. national team. I thought, I'm going to do that, right? Won our first gold medal. 2013, won my second. Came back from that game, and all of a sudden the Dallas Diamonds, one of the epic teams in the history of the sport, was folding. Could no longer afford to put a team on the field. So I get this call from a team in Allen called the Texas Revolution. Now, it's a men's indoor football team, okay? And I have no idea why they want to meet with me. But I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to rock with this. So I put on really tall shoes. I'm not kidding about that because I am only 5'2". I did. I put on some high boots that day, and I went in for the meeting. The coach was not really so excited about me being there. You could tell, you know, he was an Alabama football coach. All right, y'all know what that means, right? I'm sitting here, he's here, drawing in a non-existent playbook. He did not want to be in that meeting. But right across the table from me is the president of the team, Jen Welter, we are so excited to meet with you. And I was like, what is this guy trying to sell me? He looked like he was trying to sell a used car and he was trying pretty hard, right? I was like, uh-huh. I was like, you know, we think it would be great if you would come out and go through a day of training camp with our guys, like get some pub. And I was like, hmm, wait, so what you're telling me is that you want me to come out and just like run some ladder drills with you guys and smile for the camera? He's like, yeah, we think it'd be awesome. <clears throat> Absolutely not. I just won my second gold medal. And to me, as an athlete, that's really insulting. And if I was any one of your guys on your team, I would absolutely hate it. If you want to do anything with me and your football team, I either do everything that they do step for step, hit for hit, or I do nothing at all. Now, he looked like I had just smacked his mama. <laughs> I had this moment of, oh, what did I just do? I think I might have just gotten myself killed. And the coach looked up at me and he smiled. It was in that moment that I knew I had stepped into my destiny for the second time. The first time was when I started playing football. The second one was when I talked that moment into existence because that was not what they wanted. It was not a legit shot. There are a lot of you in here I would tell you that you will have an opportunity where you can make something legitimate in your life or you can let them use you. 
okay? Now, when you do that, I don't care how you get in the door. What matters is what you do when you get there. So you got to kick a little butt, okay? So it was not supposed to be a legit shot, but all, the, all of a sudden, I spoke it into existence, right? That president, ooh, he was frightened, right? He was like, uh, 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 coach, uh, do you think it would be too much of a distraction if she went through all of training camp? Coach Dub looked at him and he said, <laughs> with an attitude like that, hell nah, she'd be the best thing for this football team. She'd give these boys a kick in the butt. And then he looked at me and he said, every drill, yes, coach, step for step, yes, coach, hit for hit, yes, coach. If you sidestep one drill, I swear I'm going to cut you, yes, coach. If one guy sidesteps you, I'm going to cut him, and I'm going to tell him all about it, too. Y'all trying out for this football team. Yes, coach. Frankly, I don't think you're going to make it. I don't know either, coach. And one more thing. You can't play linebacker for me. You're too light in the butt. You get killed. You're going to have to play running back. Whoa, coach. So you want me to do exactly opposite what I've been good at my whole career? Yep. I'm honestly a little bit more afraid of uh, playing offense than I am of playing against men. Too bad. That's the only way we can take you. Well, all right then. So we did it. Now, when I got to the team training camp, there were two things those guys needed to know. Number one, are you here for the right reasons? Do you belong? Physically, can we hit you with everything we got and will you get back up and do it again? I was not a running back. I was not good but they needed to see that no matter what, I was gonna get up and I'm like, hey, I can do better. Boom, take the very best hits that they had. Boom, I can do better, all right? That was number one. All right, just take a hit, all right? Then number two, do you belong? Is it gonna be awkward? And for those of you who have been in this, ladies, I am talking to you. You have a choice when you're going into a situation where they're, they are not used to having you there. I want you to assume that it's not the guys don't want you there. It's just that they're not used to it, okay? Because we make it awkward a lot of the times. Guys are so scared now to offend us that they're walking around on eggshells like, oh my gosh, is she going to freak out, right? And I've been in the most male-dominated situations, and I can promise you they were all like, oh, is she going to freak out? So you can take that tension out of the situation by giving them the benefit of the doubt, Okay? I had to do it with humor. That's just my way. I just laugh about things. I'll smile and keep it moving, right? So there was this moment in training camp and you know, we're transitioning from one drill to the next and the uh, <clears throat> running backs coach said, hey running backs, you guys have your balls? This is an easy one. So one of the linebackers was like, yeah coach, all but Jen. So I just walked up to him and I smiled put my hand on his chest. I said, that's okay, baby. When I need some balls, I'll just take yours out of your wife's purse. <laughs> Game over. We're good. Because they knew they weren't going to offend me. It wasn't going to be awkward. There were going to be crazy moments. You have a woman on a men's professional football team. It's going to be awkward. Get over it. If it's not intentional, if it's not meant to degrade you, man, put them on notice at times. But just smile and keep it moving. I literally, one of my favorite lines, and I use it all the time, is you do realize you said that out loud, right? And I'll just keep moving, right? Like, I, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. I'm just going to keep it moving. Those guys protected me. They looked out for me. They taught me so many lessons. And I talk about them, not the NFL, because if I wasn't successful playing with those men, I never would have been able to make it to the NFL, right? One of the guys, Clinton Solomon, taught me a great lesson. Before I even got out there, he was a former NFL receiver, and he said, you are the best thing that's happened to this league since I got here. And I want you to know that the locker room handles itself. One of those guys gives you a hard time, don't you dare let him see that he got to you. It's like, if I hear about it, I'll, I'll, I'll set the tone, right? I got your back. Locker room handles itself. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm not going to let anybody see anything. So I'm in, in training camp, and I didn't, I didn't know what he was talking about, but Solo comes up to me and he was like, little mama, I got this. Uh, I don't know what you got, but okay. Apparently one of the cornerbacks was saying, I hope she runs my way, because if she does, I'm gonna take her out. Solo heard about it. It's a great one to hear about it. Your number one player, your number one receiver. He said, coach, I need some one-on-ones right now. This guy, me and him, one-on-one. -on -one. 
He looked at the quarterback. He's like, yo, I'm going to run a fade. I'm going to catch a touchdown on you. Runs down, catches a touchdown. He said, you still want to talk crap to a girl? Let's do it again. Boom, lines up again. Hey, I'm taking it to the house right here. Ten times in a row. So you are not good enough to talk crap to a girl. You need to focus more on your game because I got you cut today. And he did. And he taught me to let men be men at times. Ladies, just because you are physically capable of opening a door doesn't mean that somebody opening it for you does not mean you're not capable. Right? Smile, laugh, nod, have fun with it. It took me being able to rock with the guys to make it with the guys. The reason I got my shot in coaching was coming into the next season, we had a brand new head coach. I walked into a, an event and all those guys saw me and they picked me up and they're tossing me around like a football because relative to them, I am one, <laughs> right? But he looked and he said, who is this girl that all my guys love? And somebody smiled and said, coach, that's your running back. He said, I had no idea that those guys would love you. I knew everything about you, but I never imagined that they would love you like that. So he grilled me in football, all this stuff. Man, put me to task. I thought, I have nothing to lose. I'm done with this team. I survived playing on a team for a year. I was on the team for a whole year. So I got tackled by big men every day for a year. It was painful, but I survived. That's what I can say about it. All right. I thought I was done, so I laid on the car, all the cards on the table. Hey, they were really bad about this. Team doesn't take care of the guys. I would stand up for them all the time because, oh, wait, I was the number one story in the country right now. Go ahead and cut me. They're afraid you'll cut them. Oh, no, cut me. I'll tell them why. I'll tell them all why. So while those guys looked out for me on the field, I looked out for them off the field. So they had a lot of, we had a lot of mutual respect and love for each other. We took care of each other in the ways that we could, Right? So Wendell calls me the next day and he was like, all Devin, who was his uh, defensive coordinator and I could talk about is how you have to coach this football team. And I said, dude, are you crazy? I don't want to coach football. Uh -uh. I'm playing. I'm at the top of my career. You know, I just played a season against men. I could do anything in this game, right? I've seen it faster and harder. I could go back to the women's game and still dominate. I don't want to coach football. And you want to throw me right into men's professional football? You are crazy. And he said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this damn job. And I said, no, click. Didn't want to coach football. Was never, was never anything I set out to do. And so when I tell y'all I never dreamt about the NFL, I'm telling you the honest truth. Okay? So the next day he calls me back and he said, you know, Jen, I realized something. You didn't turn me down. You turned the organization down. Busted. He's a pretty smart guy. Because I knew how the organization treated people, and I, I, I thought I was done with it, right? So he said he had walked into the office, and the, everybody got really nervous. He's like, uh, uh, Coach, uh, we saw that you met Jen Welter. <laughs> you got to watch out for her. <laughs> and he said, huh. He said, in my mind, I realized anybody that made them not that nervous was exactly the person I needed on my staff. So well, he said, watch out for her. What do you mean? You got to watch out for her. I just hired her. She's coaching for me. So he called me up and told me I was coaching football, even though I had never accepted the job. He accepted it on my behalf. Thankfully, I like to say Wendell Davis saw something in me before I even saw it in myself. And that is one of the biggest secrets, I think, to when you talk about women in male-dominated environments, or how do, you, how do you create that diversity? It's sometimes it's pushing people and seeing something that they haven't even seen yet in themselves, okay? Because I never would have coached professional football if he hadn't done that. If he hadn't accepted a job on my behalf that I had turned down, right? Now, how do you step from there to the NFL? Because at that time, the NFL was the no female league. When we started playing football, they would say it was the final frontier for women in sports. I promise you, it never once crossed my mind that the NFL was a place that I could even step a toe in the water. And certainly not as a coach. I'd never even been on the sidelines with a press pass, okay? I'd barely been to NFL games, probably about seven in my life at that time. But at the NFL owners meeting, when they announced Sarah Thomas as the very first female ref, Somebody asked Bruce Arians in a press conference if he could ever see a female coaching in the NFL. And Bruce being Bruce, he said, absolutely. 
a second a woman can make somebody better in the NFL, she'll be hired. So I went back to my coach. I heard about this, and I talked to my head coach. And he was like, well, we should call Bruce. And I looked at him like he was crazy because that was crazy. And he said, can you get me his number? I'm thinking, dude, you played in the NFL. Can't you get his number? Why me? I've never even called an NFL hotline, right? Like, I never even got real tickets off StubHub. I was probably in the parking lot trying to get some, right? We don't call the NFL. This is the no female league, and you want me to call? You are crazy. So I got home, and it was bothering me like crazy. And see, being a female athlete is a full-time hustle. I think that's why I chose the number 47, because I had to have like 47 jobs. Well, on that one, I, on that day in particular, I created a new one. And it wasn't Devin Wyman's assistant coach. It was his assistant. <clears throat> so I went on the Arizona Cardinals website, and I found a number. And I called on behalf of myself, as if I wasn't myself. I was Devin Wyman's assistant, and head coach Devin Wyman had heard that Bruce Arians thought female coach in the NFL, and he wanted him to know that there was already a female coaching in men's professional football. And I talked my way all the way to Bruce's assistant. And I talked to him about myself again, as if I wasn't myself. And I told this story about this female coach and how the head coach really wanted to reach out to Bruce on her behalf. And he said, you know what, I think this is a call Bruce would really want to take. He said, but we're, you know, kind of busy getting ready for that thing called the NFL draft right now. But I'll have him call you back. I thought I had gotten blown off, but I was pretty proud of myself that I picked up the phone. I was like, I did that. Woo! That was kind of cool. Two weeks later, I walk into practice. And we used to practice at, our practice would start at 6 a.m. Because all of these guys had to actually go to work for their real jobs after they you know, practiced for arena football because it wasn't a, a full-time professional. You know, they, they were still on the pro level too, working on the professional. Right, we need some more zeros for that, just like the women. I thought I had left it when I, le when I entered men's professional football. It was the same hustle, just a few more dollars, right? And Devin is beaming. Now, Devin Wyman is six foot eight, and he's not a basketball six foot eight. He's a football six foot eight. This is a very large man. And anytime he's that exciting, I don't care if it's a good thing or not, it's still a little frightening. And I'm really sleepy. I mean, I was really sleepy. It's like five something, right? He's like, Jen, you'll never guess who I talked to yesterday. And I was like, I have no idea. He said, Bruce Arians. We talked for about an hour. And he opened the phone call with, all right, coach, tell me about this girl. From there, Bruce asked him if I would be interested in the Bill Walsh Minority Fellowship, which I don't know if you guys know, but that was originally designed to increase the presence of African-American males in coaching ranks, former players. So by the way, all my players would tell me that I was black, just so y'all know. They would, they'd be like, Coach Jean, you know you're black, right? I'd be like, yes, I do actually. But it's a very important point because what they realized is that our hustle was very much the same. And that's one of the reasons why we worked is because though people saw being a woman as being very different, to us it was a football team, right? And their struggle was my struggle and they would actually say we thought it was hard on us, but man, I can't even imagine getting into this sport as a woman. When I met with Bruce on the sidelines for the very first time, I realized in about 2.2 .2 seconds why that man was so successful as a coach. I knew this was a man I would have run through a wall for. He was a coach I would have killed to play for because I felt like I'd known him my whole life in about 30 seconds. He was so easy and so normal and so natural. A man who wears his power so lightly, right? With such ease. That's how you know what an expert is. I don't have to tell you I'm the head coach. Everybody already knows. He brought in this one woman who is surrounded by all these guys, comes over, he's like, man, coach, I've been really looking forward to meeting you. And he said, you know, you know I can only put these guys in pads about 14 days. How the F, I don't mean football, am I supposed to build, when I, build a team when I can only put these guys in pads 14 days? I said, I don't know, coach, maybe you should come grab some of my guys from Arena, because I can promise you they haven't been out of pads 14 days. And frankly, I don't think I was out of pads 14 days my whole career. He said, by the way, 
I F and cuss. I said, good, it's F and football. And in that moment, he looked at me and he just nodded because that was a test. If the F word, and I don't mean football, could shake me on the sidelines of OTAs, how in the heck would I be able to handle becoming the first female coach in the NFL? So I would say the F word kind of got me my job. So y'all might not want to hate on that word because it's not the word that should offend you, it's the use. And I say that all the time. It can be the best word in, word in the world. And that day it was. At the end of that, he said, hey, Jen, can you wait to the end of practice because I want to talk to you? And I thought, shoot, I can't see anything. I'm too short, but there is no place in the world I would rather be. We talked at the end, and he said, when I was coaching, one of the best coaches I ever saw was at Heinz Junior College. He was a receiver's coach, and her name was Dot Murphy. The fact that that hasn't changed in all these years is not good. I don't know yet if I can make this happen. I have to get a lot of yeses, but I want you to know it's in my heart to try. Guys, there's nothing in this world that is not possible. Even if it's a dream that you did not dare to dream, it's still something that you can make happen in your own life. But you have to be bold enough to own your own destiny and be willing to bet on yourself every step of the way. Because if I wasn't willing to play for a dollar a game, I certainly would have had no business becoming the first female to coach in the NFL. I hope you all will take that into your own lives and just learn how to play big, even when you're five foot two. Thank you so much. You better get a little loud though. I mean, like, it's football. You still soft.